So a warm welcome, everyone, and to those of you watching online, whether you're in, in this province or in another province, a warm welcome to you. So we've arrived at the last weekend of the summer, at least that's how I think of it. Ah, oh, that's right. <laughs> so kids are bummed out and parents are thrilled because school is starting. But a lot of changes. Next week, we're going to kick off the new church year. We're going to be installing Pastor Mike. So a lot of exciting things ahead. The staff's actually been working very busily through the summer to get ready for a, a great new year. So we look forward to that. Now, today we're going to be uh, celebrating the Lord's Supper. And uh, if you're at home, you might want to gather your elements. If you manage to come into the sanctuary and slip past the table with the elements, maybe while we're singing, you might want to go back and grab one of those little cups and be ready for that. As I was uh, praying this morning about the service and thinking about it, this verse passed through my mind, and I found myself praying it. And I think it's a beautiful passage in light of what Pastor Mike will be uh, preaching on today, Pastor Mike is preaching on 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and how we are all cracked pots, right, that God uses. But it says this, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them. Uh, you know, it's actually a really wonderful thing to feel our smallness and to feel God's greatness. And as we're about to worship God, let's take a moment in silent prayer and, and, and just simply allow ourselves to be small before him and him to be great in our eyes. Let's pray. Here we are, Lord God, frail human beings, wondrous creations of you, and yet really so fragile at the same time, but that just gives us opportunity to wonder at your greatness and your love for us. And so, as we come to worship you today, please move by your Spirit to draw us close because of your love and your mercy. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me and allow me to greet you in God's name today? Grace to you, everyone, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. Let's worship him this morning.
glorify your name. You are holy. You are worthy of our praise. We turn our affection and our attention towards you this morning. God, you are seated high above it all. You are enthroned in glory. God, we give you our attention.
I'd like to invite Sarah Prinz to come up to the platform. Sarah's going to be making her profession of faith today. And uh, here, here she comes. And uh, I want to introduce you to Sarah if you don't know her. I think a lot of people know Sarah because she grew up in this church. She was baptized here. Uh, I guess she would have been baptized in the other church, right? Yeah. The other building, right? Yeah. But uh, come, just, just come a little bit more central here, uh, Sarah. So, but anyway, Sarah is a Redeemer student, and uh, she has loved the Lord for as long as she can remember. Uh, she went through uh, a family, you know, challenging time. Their family went through a challenging time, and that became an opportunity or an occasion for Sarah to become much more... Um, much deeper in her faith, to pursue God more. And all of that has formed her into the woman she is. And having met Sarah, I want to say that's a beautiful, young uh, Christian woman. And uh, before she goes back to her third year of Redeemer, where she's uh, studying business management and hopes to go into the world of agriculture, she knew that she wanted to make profession of faith. So she contacted me way back in May, because she knew before she went to Redeemer, she had wanted to take the step of standing here and declaring before all of you that she loves the Lord, that she intends to follow him with her life, and, uh, and uh, that she wants to be fully a part of the church. And so, Sarah, we're so thrilled that you are here making this step today. And I'm going to ask you four questions, and you're asked to answer, I do, in each case. Do you embrace Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, believing that God sent him into the world to die for our sins? I do. Do you believe that the Bible is God's word and that you are joining a church that is faithful to that word? I do. Do you accept as your own all the promises God made to you when you were baptized as an infant? I do. And do you commit to sharing in the life of the church and to using the gifts God has given you to serve him wherever in the world he may lead you? What a beautiful thing. You know, I wasn't here when Sarah was baptized as a baby, but everything God said to her, um, which was a promise then, right? It was a promise because she wasn't old enough, obviously, to receive it. Now, in this moment, she's completing that circle and saying, yes, God, it got through to me, and I'm yours. Sarah, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I now welcome you into all the privileges of full communion. I welcome you to full participation in the life of the, of the church. I welcome you to its responsibilities, its joys, and its sufferings. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And now we, as a congregation, have the opportunity to tell Sarah we will be there for her as we ought, as her brothers and sisters in the Lord. And you can do that by reading this sentence with me together. Thanks be to God. We promise you our love, encouragement, and prayers. Now, there are a few things I want to do. First of all, I want to give Sarah a big round of applause and a welcome. And then, Sarah, before I pray for you, I want to just present you with two things. One is just a certificate saying that this moment happened, right? And the other one is a, a journal. So we used to give books that people could read, uh, read all about God. Now we give out books where they can write to God their thoughts. And so I'm going to present that to you. But, Sarah, I want, along with everyone here, to pray for you. Uh, you, you have a, you're going into agriculture and... We need people in that field serving God, and so we're thrilled that we have one in you. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, thank you for Sarah. She loves you. Um, you she's been on a journey. Sometimes that journey's been joyful. Sometimes it's been challenging. But all along the way, you've been with her, and you've been in her heart telling her, Sarah, I love you, calling her to yourself. And now here she stands telling the world she got the message. She's embraced the message. She loves you. You're her Lord. You're her Savior. And Father, we just pray that this would truly be a milestone for her, that this would be a day that she remembers as that moment. Not necessarily the beginning, but that important moment in her life when she 
said, I'm going for it. And Father, as she goes back to Redeemer, we pray that you would guide her in her friendships and in her studies and help her to prepare for this career uh, because you want us to represent you in the world in all kinds of vocations. And she's chosen agriculture, and we pray that she could really find you and find your joy in her service to you in that area. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sarah, you, you can be seated now, but we're really thrilled for you. I'm going to invite up uh, our elder, Joe Veenstra, who's going to lead us in our congregational prayer today. And uh, just before Joe comes, so I don't have to come up and say this a little later, um, we always take uh, two offerings uh, at, at church. And, uh, you know, sometimes people wonder, why do we take two offerings? And I always say, well, why not take two offerings? Why take only one when you could take two, right? But no, really, it just allows us to support the church and to support another cause. And uh, so the first cause, which is our church, you know, God is doing great things here, and he's, and he's doing it um, in part through the offerings that you faithfully give every Sunday. So I want to encourage you to keep, keep that up. But the second offering is for World Renew. We reach out to the whole world uh, to, to alleviate suffering, suffering through disaster relief and education and all these good things. Uh, and uh, so you can give online or in the foyer uh, when you leave. And Joe, I give it to you. Good morning. Yes, thank you. Let us continue to um, yeah, speak with God through prayer. Dear Father, we are so thankful, as is mentioned earlier, that we're here just to raise you up and to glorify you. And Lord, so just thank you that we were able to praise you through song. And um, Lord, just uh, give you our hearts in that. And now we just reach out to you in our prayer. Lord, you um, you look kindly on us and, and um, with love to... Uh, that we can come and reach out to you. So Lord, this morning I just want to bring for you, bring to you our church. And Lord, it seems like we're in a, yeah, a new season, new beginnings um, with fall coming on. Lord, there is a lot happening. And Lord, in that, we ask you that you will give us joy in that. You will raise up the workers that, uh, that are needed for different places. And Lord, we thank you for those who have stepped into different areas to um, be used for you, to reach this area, to reach those who uh, do not know you. So Lord, open up hearts to those who um, you have called already. And Father, too, I just want to lay before you, um, yeah, our schools. Um, locally and and more broadly is um, they are opening up universities and colleges. Lord, I just ask for protection and your blessing on all those involved in um, education and that um, the hearts will be protected, that students will be open to the good things of you and Lord, I just ask that you protect them from the things that are not of you. And Lord, bless all those who are involved in education, the teachers, school bus drivers, those who uh, look after buildings. Lord, let them know that their purpose is of you. Lord, I just want to lay before you um, those in our church who are mourning, who, are, um, who need your comfort. So will you continue to hold them in your hands? I pray for Matilda, Lord, that you will work in that situation with her, her heart. Lord, you will just um, 
bring about healing there and bring about an appointment that can happen, the, a procedure to um, look after her in that. Also, Lord, I lay before you Lucy. We thank you for her healing. And I bring before you Glenn and Martin, Eve, and Andy, and also Rick, Lord, that you will uh, continue to be there, their comfort. Lord, I just want to thank you for Pastor Mike this morning and how you have prepared him for, for the message that you have given him this morning. Will you just give him confidence, boldness, and Lord, let our hearts be open to what you have prepared ahead of time for him to say. So bless him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So, yeah, I just have a few announcements this morning. A couple of birthdays we'd like to celebrate. Excuse me, Kevin? Wow, okay. So it is Nick and Sharon's anniversary today, Kevin just informed me. So uh, congratulations. I, you're a day, be, day after us, correct, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Um, yeah, a couple birthdays to celebrate. Joanna DeVries celebrates her 82nd birthday coming up on Saturday. And then also, not sure how we missed it, but it's Annie Birdgrass. It was Annie Birdgrass' birthday on August 10th. So, yeah, let's just celebrate them. <laughs> and an announcement for the seniors regarding their barbecue, which was scheduled for the 15th. It is canceled, but certainly next Sunday as we celebrate a kickoff here as for, with the barbecue, please all join us. That would be great. And then now, I'd like to, um, yeah, just, uh, we're going to have a kickoff video that is coming on, and then after that, Camille will come up and speak regarding Brent Brett Almond that is coming here this Friday. Um, so I just wanted to come up here and invite the parents and um, young adults for next weekend. So we're going to keep it 100 um, in this church, which means keep it real and authentic. Um, and I just wanted to say that um, I was able to kind of go through some of Brett Allman's uh, videos and podcasts, and I am so excited and looking forward to next weekend um, as he comes and talks about um, some really taboo topics in some places, or some people would like to say they're taboo, but I've noticed that we're a church who aren't going to shy away from talking and learning and addressing and um, kind of understanding more about um, when it comes to mental health, sex, and pornography. And Brett Allman is doing a parenting um, speaking arrangement on Friday. And then uh, for the young adults, he will be um, coming in and speaking with us 
Saturday. And so I am really excited and I am really hoping that some of you guys will be out there. You know, you can make it a date night, parents, <clears throat> have some dinner and then come on out, you know, and have an awesome, wonderful conversation about how, oh, this was awesome, this was fun, you know? And then some notepads, maybe have some candy, some popcorn, you know, because it's gonna be some real interesting topics. You know, it's cool, kernels. Shout out to kernels out there. But like, yeah, so I just wanted to come up here real quick. I set a timer because I can talk a lot. Um, And so please enjoy the video. Father came up to me and said, Brett, how do I talk to my daughter about sex? By the way, she hates me. And I said, what do you mean she hates you? And he said, oh, forget about that. How do I talk to her about sex? I'm like, dude, forget about sex. What do you mean she hates you? And I realized that I have spent 25 years now talking to parents and leaders, but I've never addressed the foundations. Culture is just so different. If you look at the ages that kids are dealing with things, sometimes I think parents don't even know what to do. How do we talk to a, a you know, grade six kid about sex or pornography or what they might see online? How to deal with alcohol and drugs, how to deal with interpersonal relationships and communication with teachers, and there's a million things. And that doesn't start as a parent like June of your grade 12 year but you talk about everything. So there's no unwritten rules. I would have yearly family meetings. These studies that say, if you eat dinner together, all the negative things parents don't want, drugs, alcohol, sex, kids dropping out of school, all of those things go really far down. Our kids are not with us forever. We better prepare them for life. I will say this about Brett Ullman. Janet and I plan to be there because it's not just for parents, um, but certainly uh, I wanna know what's going on in the world with our younger people, uh, our teens, our young adults, that kind of thing. So I I will definitely be there looking forward to that. So, all right. (laughs) Mike, why don't you come up and bring the message uh, today? Thanks, Joe, Camille, Pastor Tom's, the whole group effort around here. That's good. Uh, obviously, you've seen the video from Brett Allman a few times if you've been here the last couple Sundays. So we do invite you to come. Obviously, we want you to come because we have to pay for the expense of him coming too. So we would appreciate uh, you supporting in that way. And of course, the material, I think, will be very interesting and lead to some good conversation. I know I was invited to join the young adults in that conversation on Saturday, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, I'm Pastor Mike. If you're not familiar with this face, I'm now the pastor here of discipleship at Maranatha. (laughs) Thank you. Uh, If you're new, maybe you've recently moved to the area like I have, or maybe you're, you know, you've made a new commitment and this is sort of a brand new worship space for you, or, or maybe you're just joining us for the first time online. I get it. I'm new too, right? And so, you know, there's something fearful and yet fun about being the new guy if you embrace it. So later, if, you don't, if you're here and you're new and you don't know who to talk to, just come find me. I've only been here for a few weeks on staff, so we can know no one and get over the awkwardness over here in the corner somewhere together. I really want to thank Maranatha Church, uh, especially the welcoming team. I didn't tell them I was going to do this, um, but... Deanna Hall, Aaron Stickland, and Janet Steigen go, if you're here, can you please stand? (laughs) (laughs) That was a short time, Deanna. I barely even saw you. I'm not sure if this motivates or encourages people to join teams at Maranatha Church, but I did it anyways. I don't know if you know, but these women have worked tirelessly to help myself and my family settle here in Belleville from very, very thoughtful welcome baskets, including toys for our kids to play when we first got here and didn't even have our moving truck here yet. Uh, And they were running around in circles around the house. (laughs) Um, To finding a list of babysitters, to offering us temporary housing. You know, we actually had three meet and greets, one at each of their houses just this past week. So these women's, uh, these women, let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. I've got an image to share with you, hopefully. We'll see if anything's going on. Do we have any images? Oh, we do. That wasn't the image. Next one. There it is. Now I gave away the punchline. Anyways, does anyone know? (laughs) Pretend like you don't. 
who these globby ceramic uh, lava lamps belong to. Now you can show it. Anyone want to guess Seth Rogen? Very good. Do you know that Seth Rogen is into, like, really into ceramics? He sold a fluorescent vase, an orange fluorescent vase, I think, for $12,000 on auction. If you can show a picture of the vases here. Look, I'm no art dealer, <laughs> but that, that's a waste of money. <laughs> you can show a picture of, of Seth again. When I think of a crackpot, this is what I picture. <laughs> Both creator and let's call him his unique creations. I entitled this sermon or this message, Crackpots, All of Us, because of this verse. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7, which is our focal verse, our focus verse this morning. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God, right? And not from us. I love this verse, especially for Labor Day weekend, because we're all caught in this sort of time in between. We're all faced with these questions, you know, what new commitments am I going to commit myself to, right? If you're a Christian, I really feel like we need to always be reminded of this verse. Whenever you think about new commitments, you see, none of us should say, you know, no, (laughs) I cannot be used by God in this way. You know, I'm just ordinary. I've got nothing special or spectacular to offer anyone. Or no, I'm so sorry, you've got the wrong guy or gal, right? I'm just really not all that put together. There's a lot of screws loose in my life. You know, I just don't feel like I have the strength to really do something like that. Look with me if you can put that verse up once more. Where does the Bible say that our all-surpassing power comes from? I heard it, right? Does it come from you? Does it come from me? It comes from God. I think Stephen said that. Thanks, Stephen. You and I, we're just clay jars. We're crackpots. Now, let me be clear. This is an old term. It has nothing to do with crack or pot. Although Seth Rogen's uh, not, maybe not the best character to disassociate those two from. Uh, but it meant to speak to brokenness, to weakness. You know, sometimes mental health, which we're going to talk about with, with Brett Ullman later this week. You know, we're not all put together. We're all cracked pots. All of us are odd in our own little way, some of us big way, right? You know, we can feel, we can look and feel kind of funky at times. I'm a funky orange vase. We're emotionally and physically, you know, we're fragile. People can chip away at us. They can. Rather easily, friends, You know, foes, family members. We shatter, we break apart suddenly and easily. I mean, this can happen to any of us at any time. Surely, going through this pandemic has shown us all this, right? You know, bugs, breakdowns, they come without moment's notice. All of us are made of the same compacted carbon, just ordinary, everyday, earthy creatures. You know, I think a clay jar, the Apostle Paul was really brilliant with this, a clay jar is a pretty good metaphor of the weakness and fragility that comes with being a human being. Just the other day, maybe you could put the picture up, uh, the other day my wife Loretta broke the handle off of my favorite ceramic mug. We all have a favorite mug, right? It's the one we go to to fill our coffee first thing in the morning. I I really like foxes, so I really liked this bug. She said she just picked it up and it just exploded. (laughs) But I still stared at her from my seat without my coffee for five minutes. (laughs) By the way, we have a really great uh, marriage ministry (laughs) at Maranatha, which I encourage you all to to get involved in. You know, we all have this sort of hardened exterior, but inside we're vulnerable, you know, we're we're fragile, we can be emotionally weak daily (laughs) in different moments of the day. And yet, get this, and this is really the message I'm going to talk about this morning, and this really is incredible. In God's economy, in God's way of looking at things, by God's design, our weakness is his asset. 
Your weakness is his asset. Do you know that your weakness is God's asset? It's his intention. It's by God's design. As it is written, to show the world that the all-surpassing power, that the all-surpassing power comes from who? God, not from you or me. There's something really humbling and yet I think very encouraging and motivational in those words. You know, when you're approached and asked to do something around here to help out, to use your gift, and let's just get this out of the way now, you will be. <laughs> sort of an annual September tradition around here, really in all churches. We didn't see the video, but we have our kickoff next Sunday already. When you're approached and you're asked to help out to use your gift in some way, and in that moment you suddenly just feel small, ordinary, inadequate, that's still no reason not to. It's no reason not to. None of us should ever think, you know, I'm too ordinary and undistinguished and insignificant. I can't do anything. In fact, biblically, as we see from this word, from the words of the, of the Apostle Paul, this argument's completely unfounded because of God's intentions and design for us in our weakness. Look with me now at the whole text, uh, the context surrounding this focal verse. Actually, before we do that, please pray with me. Holy Spirit, come and fill our minds and hearts with the understanding of this treasure that exists in these jars of clay to show your glory. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have minds open to this message and hearts ready to receive it and live it out in a way that showcases to the world the incredible treasure that is at work in those who believe. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12, the words are also up on the screen. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed. Anyone here perplexed? Right? But not in despair. In other words, never without hope. Persecuted, but not abandoned. We are never abandoned by God. Struck down, but not destroyed. Anyone I'm sure there's someone here who needs to hear those words, right? You're feeling struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. The Apostle Paul is talking about suffering, our daily sufferings. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. As I mentioned, this is the Apostle Paul speaking this morning, writer of most of the New Testament, the last quarter or so of your Bible. And you would expect him to say, so then death is at work in us, but life is also at work in us, right? That would sort of logically follow. But that's not what he says. Did you catch that? Death is at work in us, he says, but life is at work in you. There is something about our suffering, the daily cross that we bear every day, the everyday trials and tribulations that we face that can bring life to someone else. Do you ever think about that this week when you're facing a trial, that in that tribulation you can bring life to someone else? in your circle, at work, or in your family. You know, if you really strain to listen this morning, you can hear echoes of the gospel here. Echoes of the gospel. What is grace? God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E, grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. His, you know, His life for yours and for mine. His pain for our gain. By His wounds we are healed. 
Hebrews 12, verse 12 says of Jesus, for the joy set before him, for the joy, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. In other words, Jesus had a certain perspective on his sufferings, which Paul is also trying to live into. He's trying to carry his cross, and he's, he's explaining this to all of us who desire to follow Jesus this morning. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. See, the Corinthian church here is really struggling to accept this message of the gospel because they're really struggling to accept Paul and his hard life, his troubled life, as a true messenger of this gospel. You know, I mean, how, how, can, a, how can a man, how can a weak man who has a, a thorny life, by his own admission, he has a thorn in his flesh, which he can't get rid of, and God will not take away in spite of all of his prayers. How can a man like this, how can he be one who can come here and claim to, to give us victory in Christ Jesus? How can he even claim that based on his troubled life? You know, and you can, almost, you can almost picture somebody thinking, you know, I've sailed the Mediterranean many times. I've never been shipwrecked. Paul's been shipwrecked three times. God can't be with him, or at least he's not happy with him. You know, we often think similarly when we experience suffering or when we see others have suffering. You know, God can't be pleased with me if he's there at all. The Corinthian mind towards Paul is rather similar to, to how we might think of someone or look at someone and think, really? You know, how can that guy pray over me? How can there be really any power coming from his fumbling words? Or, you know, I don't really see what God's good plans really are for her. I mean, I don't see fullness of life in her life. You know, so often we confuse the container with the content. My weakness, my limitations never limit God. God is not limited to my limitations. I think church history is probably the best example of this, right? Churches, as we all know, are not perfect. <laughs> there are sexual scandals. Regular mishandling of the Word of God and deep hurt. I mean, look around. I don't see any of your heads turning. Look around. There you go, a few of you. There are some pretty odd containers of God and His grace sitting here this morning. <laughs> some, of you, some of you are thinking, who are you calling odd? <laughs> right? This is your first message. <laughs> Also, don't look at one person for too long, <laughs> yeah. especially if that happens to be your spouse. <laughs> you get a long talking for that <laughs> later on. You know, the church across the ages, and certainly in our present age, is hard-pressed on every side. You know, perplexed. What are we even doing? Persecuted, but notice, never destroyed. You cannot do in the church. Why? Because the all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. There is a light levity that can come to your Christian life when in humility you understand this and apply this to your life. It's okay to be ordinary. You don't have to hide it. In fact, more harm is often done in your life and in our churches and certainly in our witness when we fail to admit this. If you're a Christian, the best thing about you, the most impressive thing about you, get this. I don't know if you can guess it. What is the most impressive thing about you? I'll give you a hint. It's not you. It's God in you, the hope of glory. The most impressive thing about you is not even you. It's God in you, the hope of glory. 
Put that image of uh, Seth Rogen smiling all proud of his pots. Didn't say pot. <laughs> I don't know if I'll get in trouble saying this, but I see a bit of the face of God in that gleeful smile. God is proud of you. God loves you as you are. He made you not perfect. That's by design. He knows that you are dust, just compacted dirt. What I hear the Apostle Paul saying to all of us this morning is embrace your fragility. Embrace your ordinariness. You know, don't make it a stumbling block to ministry. Make it a sounding board. Put your unput-together, fragile life on a platform. Don't make it an excuse not to get involved in ministry and in the mission of God because God has big plans for you. And remember always to forgive others for the crackpots that they are. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. You know, pastors, parents, yourself, you know, we will all disappoint. Learn to see others and to see yourself. You know, look around. We're all just ordinary containers. But we house an extraordinary God whose transforming message can live and breathe. You know, that all-sustaining uh, power of God can work in you if you want it. He will offer it to you if you believe. And if you do believe that the all-sustaining, all-surpassing power of God can live in you, then step up and step forward and speak to it because every single day God gives us an opportunity to acknowledge our ordinariness and God's extraordinary grace. Now, there is a caution in all of this. John Christ, who's a Christian comedian, anyone follow John Christ? Nobody. Great. <laughs> in one of his talks, he talks about how, and I love this, he talks about uh, how, much white, how much white women love the Enneagram. Any white women love the Enneagram? Nobody wants to admit it. I'm not a white woman, I'm a white man, uh, but admittedly, I've studied it pretty thoroughly, the Enneagram, that is. For those unfamiliar with it, it's sort of the, the latest, greatest, or at least it's the most trendiest personality profile. You know, it, it, or profiling, it offers a number from one to nine to all of us. And it explains why it is that you do the things that you do. What is your motivation? What is your desire, your root desire that is at work in what you do? John Chris calls it, and I love this, he calls it a, a, a way to explain away your terrible personality traits. <laughs> a, a way to explain away your terrible personality traits. Sorry I'm late. I'm a four. Any fours here <laughs> this morning? You know, I know I've got a short fuse, but I'm an eight. I'm just a passionate person. Or, whoops, that happened again. <laughs> well, what can you do? I like to have fun. I'm a seven. It says right here, motivated by new experiences. Paul's not excusing away our bad habits by calling us uh, clay pots or crack pots. He's calling for each and every one of us to get into the regular habit of giving testimony to God, God's all-sustaining, all-surpassing power at work in my ordinary life, the extraordinary grace of God in every moment of every day. You know, what I love so much about the Christian life is you just get to be you. You just get to be you. Not excusing away your bad habits, but by God's design, living into your ordinariness, your fragility, your uncertainty, not covering it all up as the world would teach us to do. Learning to use your ordinariness, your fragility, your sufferings as an everyday platform for giving glory to God. I think this is most evident, at least for me, in, at funerals. I'm sure you've experienced this as well. In fact, uh, Jessica, I don't know if she's here, but Jessica Bronkema, 
still working on the Dutch names. I have a Dutch last name, and even I still struggle with them. <laughs> Hopefully I said that right. At her dad Dale's funeral, she really captured this for me. She actually brought me uh, to some, some tears at times. You know, she expressed her own pain, but she did it in a way that brought faith to those who were listening. You know, her pain was our gain. Her weakness was on display on a platform, and it brought us strength in faith and life. You know, she spoke about, she spoke very honestly about being perplexed if you were there, but she was never without hope. Her dad was struck down, but he was not ultimately destroyed. Imagine how the church would change. How your life would change if you humbly believed that you're ordinary, and that's okay, because in us is housed a God who is extraordinary. Imagine if every day and every decision you acknowledge to yourself and others that the all-sustaining, all-surpassing power doesn't come from me. It comes from who? God. Exactly. Stephen, you're right on it this morning. I love that. <laughs> you know, the Apostle Paul took a keen interest in ceramics, kind of like Seth Rogen did, but in his case, um, as an image of the Christian life. You know, clay jars were just the disposable containers, you know, packaging all the treasures and dispersing them throughout the known world, the ancient world at the time. And so they had to be emptied and filled again, emptied and filled again, emptied and filled again. They were like the cardboard Amazon uh, containers that come to your door, right? Except at the ancient world. Nothing special, but housing in them something extraordinary, something uh, that is a treasure, something worth gathering around and looking into. Jesus once said to the Father in prayer these words. Hopefully they'll be on the screen. <laughs> he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden, notice the ordinary language, you have hidden these things, he's talking about the gospel, from the wise and understanding, and you revealed them to ordinary little children. Treasures in jars of clay, you know, children are, it doesn't take, you know, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to understand the gospel. Children are often live out this ordinary, all-surpassing power the best. Um, they live out that faith in very clear and ordinary ways. You know, as we serve uh, communion here shortly, I'm reminded this morning, aren't you, that Jesus was a jar of clay. There was nothing in His appearance that attracted us to Him, as the prophet Isaiah says. As you approached Him and you gathered around Him, though, something extraordinary opened up to you. And I know there are, there are many here who have felt it the all-surpassing power of God. And remember, his life was not one where others would easily and quickly see the victory. He was, a, he was a man of sorrow, familiar with suffering. And as a clay jar, he was pressed in on every side, but he was not crushed. When he called out to the Father to take this cup from me, just like Paul called out to the Father to take this thorn out of his flesh, what was the answer that the Father gave? No. And yet Jesus was not in despair. He was never without hope. He said, not my will, but yours be done. And as Jesus was persecuted, in other words, death is at work in me, but life will come to you. As Jesus was persecuted and abandoned by his followers, you know, he carried on knowing that God had not abandoned him. And even when the Father turned his face away, and he descended into death, and he descended into hell, he was struck down, but he was not ultimately destroyed. Why? Because in, housed in this clay jar was the all-surpassing power of God. 
You know, as we break bread together and, and have uh, wine or juice together, we are reminded, I think, that this same all-surpassing, all-sustaining power is offered to you and to me in our weakness, whatever that may be for you. Death is at work in us, but life can be dispersed across the known world. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for the display of, really the gift of this all-surpassing power come to clay pots like us, to be able to house your Holy Spirit, to be able to understand the life-transforming, everlasting message of your gospel, so that when people come and approach us, they see it inside, hidden in us, a treasure worth gathering around and opening and discovering. Lord, I pray that that would happen in our lives this week, that we would embrace our ordinariness, that we would embrace our fragility, that we would speak clearly to the life in us, the most impressive thing about us, which is you and this priceless treasure that you give us in Jesus Christ. I pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Mike. As we uh, move to the Lord's Supper, a uh, passage that I thought would be an appropriate segue uh, between what Mike has just said and the Lord's Supper is 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 29. And before I read that, I, I, I'll just mention for those of you at home as well as here, I, why don't you just have your elements ready and in a moment I'll invite you to open those up. But Paul says this, he says, Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lonely things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that nobody may boast before him. And so, as Mike mentioned, you know, as we come to the Lord's Supper, there are, there are two truths going on here. And the one is we are weak. We are weak vessels. Um, we are more than that. We are people who desperately need the forgiveness of God. But the other truth is that we're loved. We're loved deeply by God. And he, he gave his son for us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we're about to participate in this Lord's Supper today, we're going to partake of a little wafer of bread, and we're going to partake of grape juice. But we pray that it could bring us into the full reality of what Pastor Mike was just talking about, this incredible power of God, this love of God through Jesus that works in us and powerfully works through us. And Lord, so that we can, we can shine uh, like the moon with the sun glowing off it, Lord God. And Lord, weak as we are, uh, we can be servants of yours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And take the bread, remembering and believing that Jesus died for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins.
And why don't you go ahead and just peel back that cup so that the grape juice is ready. In the same way, after the supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. And so drink this cup, remembering and believing that Jesus' blood was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you for what you have said to us. Thank you for how you nourish us by your Spirit through Christ. And uh, we offer ourselves to you such as we are. And thank you for taking us as we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
As we close, you know, I'm, I'm reminded, I don't know if my mother's watching, but I'm reminded of my mom's words when I was just a little boy. We were standing in church, and she always opens her hands for the blessing. And I asked her, why do you always do that? And she told me, you know, every day we need to receive the words of God because I feel weak. That's paraphrasing, but that's what I remember. She's saying, I need that blessing of God to come to my life because I know I'm going into another day, another week, where I'm going to feel weak. And so if you feel comfortable, stretch out your arms. Stretch out your hands. Receive God's blessing. Go in His peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious towards you. The Lord turn His face toward you and grant you His peace, which is only His to give. The all-surpassing, all-sustaining power of God available to you to take hold of this week in whatever weakness you find yourself in. In Jesus' name.
Thank you for joining us this morning, church. I want to remind you as well for the kickoff, be sure to bring your donation and your lawn chair with you. And you can sign up for Brett Ullman online or you can call the front office.